Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, to speak on the Horton Plains uh, threats. And so, unlike the usual talks I give, uh, including those at the uh, Society on previous occasions, today is going to be a little technical because I want to draw attention uh, to a specific uh, series of issues, taking Horton Plains as an example of a protected area, and it could be just any protected area, but I want to draw attention to the issues that need attention from uh, we, the public who care about um, the, uh, the environment and Sri Lanka's biodiversity. Before I start, I quickly want to uh, thank a few people who have helped us incredibly in the past. Uh, I might not have put everyone's names here, but they have either contributed photographs to our book or to the uh, lecture this evening or engaged in discussion with me at various points which have enriched my thinking. Before I get started, I want to clear up one thing and that's what I mean by the word conservation. This word means different things to different people and to my mind, it's a slightly technical definition, but conservation for me is what we do to allow evolutionary processes to proceed as if there had been no humans interfering with nature. It's an ideal, it's impractical, but it's the only way I know to achieve the objectives that we need to achieve if the plants and animals and ecosystems that we enjoy today are to be continued into the future. There are two elements in conservation. One is enforcement, and that's what the word protection means in the WNPS uh, name, Wildlife and Nature Protection Society, and that's enforcement. That's preventing people from going and cutting down trees, encroaching on forests, uh, hunting animals, and so on. The side that interests me rather more is the technical side the management interventions that we need to make as conservation biologists to make sure that those evolutionary processes I talked about continue. And that's a huge challenge. So when we look at protection, which is the easy part, we're looking mainly at enforcement or policing, and everyone is used to making that immediate association between the word protection and the police. This comes naturally to all of us. But the side I want to look at is slightly different. I'm looking at the Horton Plains as a critically ill patient in an intensive care unit. It is a good analogy in my view. This patient is surrounded by a whole bunch of technology which depends on research. A lot of these machines were not there 20 years ago. And research and development have brought the technology to us. At the same time, the patient's life depends not just on the technology, but also on the skill of the doctors and nurses who diagnose and prescribe his treatment. And that's the conservation biologists. And most importantly, those doctors and nurses have to be aware of the fact that this guy, though he's unconscious, has got relatives. That's us. Because we are the stakeholders in the medical decisions that are made on behalf of this patient who's lying unconscious. So the analogy I'm trying to make is that there are multiple groups of people, of constituencies, the researchers, the conservation biologists, we the public, whose job it is to combine together to deliver those conservation outcomes that I was referring to. So to get to Horton Plains National Park, this tiny piece of uh, real estate, um, in this horseshoe, that begins at about Daraniagala, the peak wilderness, proceeds across, that's the Horton Plains there, and then goes on to Hantana, and you can see Rondanigala and uh, Victoria there. These dark brown patches are what we call tropical montane cloud forests. And as you can see, there's very few of them. There's a couple there, there's a patch here, Great Western, Pidru Thalagala, and then the Knuckles Ridge. And if you add up all Sri Lanka's montane cloud forests, they add up to about the size of Randanigala Reservoir, 
which you can see there. So that's a slightly expanded view of the box and you can get a, a better idea of what I'm talking about there. So if you look at the landscape of uh, Horton Plains, which I'm sure you're familiar with, I'm not going to deal with the park in detail because I assume that all of you have been. Um, and if you haven't and you want more details, um, you should read the book that we put together. It's not my book, it's a book uh, collaboration between 13 of us specializing in different areas. And this is the view you get from near the top of Totopolakanda, looking at Kirigalpotta on that side, and there's Far In, and that's the World's End Cliff over there. And this is the north side of Totopolakanda, and if you look there, you'll see the road that snakes up the hillside from Patipola uh, to the Horton Plains. Another principal feature of the park is, of course, Kirigalpotta Peak, which people climb because of the... Uh, one thing, it's a difficult climb and it's fun. It's a lo lovely hike. And the second thing is that you get this lovely scene with Adams Peak at the other side of the Dimbulla Valley. But many people go to see uh, the World's End Cliff. And this is a view taken off the cliff, unusually from a distance. And if you look, sorry, if you look carefully, you can see the little white dot there, which is an adult man, which gives you an idea of the scale of this beautiful precipice. And that's a view taken from further south near Nagrak Estate. And that's the view that most of us go to see. And another principal feature, of course, of uh, the Horton Plains is the Bellio Lawyer that runs through uh, the, the entire park. And here at the top of Bellio, uh, at the top of Bellio Lawyer, you can see Baker's Falls, and this is the river as it snakes down towards Bellio Lawyer Rest House. Baker's Falls, everyone knows about that. Um, but less well known is Galagama Falls or Pahantudu Falls. It's uh, difficult to access at the best of times. And in the dry season, you can probably fly by and get a view like this, but it's a difficult photograph to take. I'm not going to say much more about the topo to topography of Horton Plains. I want to get um, to the vegetation. So, the first thing that you realize when you look at the forest is that the trees are stunted. They're about 10 meters shorter than the average trees at Singharata. The canopy is quite close to the ground. And you don't see a lot of things you'd see, for example, in a lowland forest like Singharata. You don't see many species of plants, especially flowering plants, with compound leaves like these. You also don't get to see woody climbers going up the trees. You don't see cauliflory, the phenomenon where fruits and flowers appear on the trunk of a tree, commonly in hull trees, kurupita trees, or drag trees. This is something that you see. You don't see buttress roots. Instead, by and large, most of the trees in montane cloud forests have got complex fine root systems which is rather different from lowland trees. And also, on the branches of these cloud forest trees, you get masses of filmy ferns. Filmy ferns are things you'll see on the forest floor in dark, cool rock crevices in Singaraja, for example, but you wouldn't see them in the canopy. In Horton Plains, uh, filmy ferns on the branches of trees are very, very common. And also vascular epiphytes, plants that grow on trees, um, flowering plants that grow on trees, are relatively rare in the Horton Plains. Of course, there are a few uh, species of orchids, very interesting endemic ones like this one, but not nearly as profuse as they are in the lowlands. What is most dramatic in the Horton Plains trees is the gnarled, twisted branches of many of the species of trees. And these immense growths of epiphytes, mainly mosses and ferns, that grow on the trees themselves. These 
species grow because during the cool nights they have an advantage. Non-vascular plants like, like mosses have an advantage in carbon exchange that uh, flowering plants don't have. And so they tend to be very profuse in montane forests like those at Horton Plains. These plants are also specially adapted to extracting water from cloud, from mist, as it passes through. As much as 30% of the water that is used by plants in montane forests comes from the mist. It's extracted from the mist. And so if the level of the mist goes up and there's less mist cover, it has serious consequences for the forest. That's an issue I'm going to come to in a little bit. And many of the trees, for example, this one, a Calophyllum walkeri, an endemic tree species, probably the most prominent tree species in Horton Plains, have uh, waxy leaves from which water uh, is repelled and drains down to the forest floor uh, very easily. The reason for this is probably because um, the, the environment is almost always damp, as a result of which uh, too much water on the, the leaf would affect photosynthesis. Um, I'm not going to explain the reasons why these trees flush red. If you read the book, you'll find out. It's a, a long story, but it's an interesting story, and it's a, a section of the book that's worth reading. But it makes this canopy of the montane rainforest very beautiful. And the canopy, this is from a height of about a thousand feet. Uh, it looks like a moss, but these are the crowns of the montane forest taken from, a, from an aircraft. The trees themselves, as you can see, and this is a site you'll commonly see in areas like the Horton Plains, have got these umbrella-like crowns uh, that are very good at extracting water from the mist as it drives through the foliage. And this water drains down to the root system. It's also used by the epiphytes. As I said, about 30% of the water is used uh, on the tree itself. It doesn't get to go down to the roots. So it's, these are very highly adapted water extracting mechanisms. And in South America, in some drier parts of the Andes where there's a lot of cloud but not much rain, people have made devices uh, that mimic uh, cloud forest trees for extracting water from the mist for drinking purposes. Of course, human involvement in the Horton Plains is very old. Dr. Siran Daranegala has done uh, a huge body of work on the stone tools and artifacts found on the Horton Plains, and it looks like there's a history of human habitation there that is at least 10,000 and probably more than 20,000 years old. So early humans occupied this habitat. We still commonly find stone tools. Actually, if you've got a sharp pair of eyes and you spend a day on the plains, you're, you stand a very good chance of finding a, a tool like this one. And we also have evidence of human involvement in this habitat from the work of uh, Dr. Ratnasiri Premathilakar, who's a paleoarchaeologist. And he's been drilling down into the peat bogs uh, using drilling machines like this, extracting pollen. This is a hugely magnified grain of pollen. And pollen tends to get, be uh, preserved in peat for tens of thousands of years. So Ratnasiri has extracted pollen up to 30,000 years old from the Horton Plains. And the lovely thing about pollen is, if you've got the pollen, you can identify the plant from which it came. So we have a really good idea of the way in which the vegetation of the Horton Plains has evolved over the past 30,000 years. It's, it's a wonderful story. And the, and the really intriguing thing that he has discovered is as early as about 13,000 years ago, the first evidence of the ancestors of rice start appearing on the Horton Plains. So it looks like Rice cultivation happened in or near this area 13,000 years ago. That's a, a phenomenal uh, discovery. It's one of the earliest uh, instances of agriculture in Asia. Uh, whether it was actually cultivated or whether these were wild plants, we still don't actually know for sure. So the first ecological story I want to tell you is about succession, because I think most of you are, are familiar with this cycle. Most of you would have seen uh, Nelu, or Strobilanthes, and this is a ubiquitous plant in the understory, in the shade of 
the, the montane forests of Sri Lanka. All Sri Lanka's montane forests have strobilanthus species growing in the, under the canopy. And these beautiful flowers um, bloom uh, synchronously, that is together. This, uh, a given species will all start blossoming at the same time. And then we all get excited when we see the photos in the newspapers and go to Horton Plains and take pictures. Sometimes two or three species will bloom together. The reasons they bloom together, you have to read in the book. But the fact is that these dense um, assemblages of strobilanthes grow under the canopy. And they bloom all together between 5 and 15 years, depending on the species, apart. So the blooming is quite rare. And when they bloom, they seed and they die. And then the understory looks very desolate because all the strobilanthus, all the nello has died. So it looks very sad. But then the following year, the seeds from those plants start the process of succession all over again. And this cycle, which might be a five year cycle or a 15 year cycle or something in between, <coughs> starts, starts up again. And succession is really what defines the landscape of the Horton Plains in general. So I want to take a couple of examples and show them to you. One is, if you look at the grasslands of the Horton Plains, you'll find that all the grasslands are basically beside the river. If you look at it from uh, a different perspective, it looks very likely that early humans set fire, they cut down the forest and they set fire to the forest and the grasslands came as a result of that burning. We know from the example I put up there of Ernst Haeckel, a German biologist who was on the Horton Plains in 1883 uh, for a few weeks and he recorded uh, almost daily burning by Sri Lankan uh, native grazers who brought their cattle up uh, to graze on the grass and the burning would give rise to a new flush of grass uh, which provided high nutrient grasses for their cattle. And indeed, if you look at a satellite map of the Horton Plains, this, this, there are maps of these you can obtain today that I've given to the society. Um, you can see that all the grasslands basically occur on either side of waterways. So there's, it's, it's, reasonably good circumstantial evidence to believe that the grasslands are, are something new. When I say new, I mean it could be several centuries or even millennia old because we know that humans have been there for a long time. But they're man-made and uh, have been kept alive by fire. The intriguing thing here is that the last great fires of the Horton Plains happened about 120 years ago because in our lifetimes, fires have been relatively rare or localized. So we have a good idea uh, of how long that disturbance that early humans made by cutting down the forest and turning it to grassland, how long it takes to start even thinking about regenerating forest on again. And one of the consequences of, um, of cutting down the forest and turning it into grassland is that we see that when you turn montane forest into grassland, the cloud that normally exists there goes up by about 100 meters. So there's less cloud cover, there's less cloud, there's less mist working its way through that canopy you saw earlier, so the plants have less water to derive. So one of the consequences of the grassland, and this is a consequence that's centuries old, is that the cloud layer has lifted. And if those grasslands are reforested again, we'll see more mist cover on the Horton Plains. A second consequence of the grasslands, you can see again in this satellite image. Uh, these lovely shapes that look like some kind of archaeological remains are the consequence of uh, the potato cultivations. These are terraces that were made for potato cultivation by a particularly foolish government de decision in the 1950s and potato cultivation went on in the Horton Plains for about 10 years and fortunately it failed as a result of which it was abandoned. But the consequence of this uh, policy folly has been that the cultivation introduced a whole bunch of exotic grasses 
into the Horton Plains. So if you take a close-up view of this former potato cultivation, you can see that the grasses growing here are very different from the grasses growing in the natural grassland. I shouldn't say natural because that's the old grassland. Um, and here you get an idea of that's the world's end cliff over there. But a consequence of these grasses, because these, these grasses that were introduced in the 1950s accidentally, because they came in with the seed potatoes, are fodder grasses. They are grasses that have been developed specially as high nutrient grasses for cattle. And now they've taken over in the Horton Plains. As a result of that, we have these huge herds of samba that eat the grass and keep it almost like a golf course. And these, this grass that samba are eating are entirely introduced European grasses. The consequence of the bad thing, in other words, the grass, is that we now have this huge population of samba. If you read Samuel Baker's hunting exploits in the Horton Plains in the 1860s, samba were really hard to find. But now they're commonplace. But the problem with having this large samba population is that samba can be quite destructive of forest trees. So about 5% of all the tree deaths on Horton Plains as a result of samba going and rubbing their antlers on the tree, destroying the bark, as a consequence of which the tree dies. So this excessive population of samba is contributing to the death of the forest. So I was talking earlier about the need for conservation interventions that recognize evolutionary processes. The right thing to do from a conservation perspective is to restore either forest or indigenous grass on these exotic alien grasses. That will impact on the samba population negatively. The samba will have a problem and uh, will have some mortality, but that's the correct conservation outcome, it's, though it's a painful one. You might think if there's too many samba, are the leopards eating them all? Well, some beautiful research has been done on the leopards of uh, this area by uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Kittle and Anjali Watson. And they found that on average, for every 100 kilometers of leopard habitat, you have about 13 adult leopards. That's not very many. Horton Plains is 31 square kilometers. You'd expect to find four or five adult leopards in the area. Of course, you're seeing them more and more often, just like you see leopards more and more often in Yala, because the leopards are becoming increasingly habituated to people on the Horton Plains. It's one of the places where you can safely watch a leopard on foot, in, indeed, as we have, uh, because they, they're not likely to attack you. Uh, we might uh, also think that if there are sufficient numbers of leopards, they'll prey on the samba. But the fact of the matter is we know from an examination of leopard feces that samba don't form a major part of the leopard's diet in this area. They're eating small animals like uh, barking deer, uh, porcupines, otters, uh, miminas, and such like. Even little crabs and rodents is part of the leopard's diet. Samba they do eat, but it's not going to make a big difference to the samba population if you added a leopard or two to this area. So if I return to the fact that this is a landscape made by fire, we can look at the modern consequences of fire. The last great fire that I am aware of on Horton Plains was in the 1980s when I remember President Jayawardner sending the Air Force up with helicopters and buckets of water to put it out. They did successfully, but it's a slow process. And the consequences of that fire are still visible even today. And now we have a terrible thing that happens. In the old days, when you burnt forest and you did nothing, it was replaced by grassland. This is the grassland that we, the landscape that we inherited 50, 100 years ago. Now, when you burn the forest or the grassland, you have Central American shrubs. These are Ostraeupatorium inulifolium, a very aggressive, invasive Central American shrub, about 10 feet tall. And it's such an aggressive plant that it shades out everything under it, and no native vegetation can happen. This growth of Ostraeupatorium, this is a plant that became widespread in Sri Lanka in the 1980s at just the wrong time for Horton Plains. This 
growth uh, doesn't see a single native plant growing inside it. This is a closer view of the same species. So we need to find ways of getting rid of this species. But the thing is, Osteopatorium, though it's so visible in this photograph, is just one of 50 odd species of alien plants that are growing in Horton Plains. The good news is that most alien species of plants need lots of sunlight. They don't grow in the shade of the forest. As a result of that, most of them are out on the forest edge or in the open sunlit areas. So we have a solution made for this problem, which is provide shade. If you shade these plants, uh, they disappear quite quickly. I'm going to give you an example of that in a little while. But it raises the question, what were the pioneer species when you had, for example, a tree falling in the forest and the sunlight coming in? What were the species that grew there? When you had a landslide leaving bare earth, what were the species that grew there before Australopatorium came into Sri Lanka? The sad thing is we have no idea. Nobody did any research in those days. And this is not a long time ago. I'm talking about the 1960s and 1970s. We have no idea what montane forest succession was in those days. But we're beginning to get some idea now. Because I found one photograph taken by H.W. Cave in the 1890s of this forest clearing on the foothills of Adams Peak. And you can see in the background the original forest and the area in the foreground that has been cleared. And what's wonderful to see in this foreground is that it's a dense mass of tree ferns about that high that are now springing up. And so it looks like tree ferns were the original pioneer species in the successional story of montane forest vegetation in Sri Lanka. And indeed, when you go and look for old sites where there have been landslides in the forest, you see sites like this. So masses of tree ferns growing together. Nobody planted these, and there's a reason they're all clumped together, because this is earth that was bared as a result of a landslide. And then, when you look even closer, you can see the beautiful site of the natural forest. You can see the red flowers of the rhododendrons, for example. The natural forest regenerating in the shade of the tree ferns. The Osteopatorium and the other foreign native plants, uh, foreign invasive plants, can't get in into the shade of the tree ferns because they don't like shade. So we have an idea that tree ferns can be a really good nurse species under which to grow native forest. So that discovery is quite recent and we are still to put it into practical use. But it all derives from uh, the knowledge we gain from a single photograph taken in somewhere around 1890.